the role of different variant observables has come up uh, a few times, and so we'll have a little bit more systematic discussion of that uh, today, uh, starting with Kazia uh, on diffeomorphism invariant observables in gravity. Thank you very much for invitation to this really exciting workshop. Uh, so I will give very coarse overview uh, of what I think is different variant observables, uh, mostly in my framework, but also in others. So, uh, so the main message of this talk, which I start with because I don't know if I get to the end of the talk, so it's better to have it at the beginning. Uh, so I'm working in perturbative algebraic quantum field theory, and you can think of it as a machinery to turn functionals of classical field configurations, so um, something we understand mostly, uh, into quantum observables. So this choice of diffeomorphism invariant observables uh, is already made at the classical level. So this talk, unfortunately, is going to be mostly classical. Uh, I want to discuss various choices of observables on this level. Okay. Uh, so this whole program of perturbative AQFT uh, aims to uh, study some aspects of observables in quantum gravity and those which are accessible to perturbative methods because this is perturbative framework. Uh, and our main goal is to study the algebraic structure they have. Now, this is not the ultimate goal, obviously, because the world is quantum. So in the end, we want to break away from this classical picture and have an intrinsically quantum formulation, but before that, we just want to understand, uh, well, the easy part, let's say. Okay, so uh, that's my excuse for being very classical at the beginning. So, uh, classically, okay, so we have uh, the theory of the metric of on the manifold M, so what are the observables? Classical observables are some functions of that metric. And let them be smooth because I'm a mathematician. Okay, so uh, there could be the local ones, which I will call here strictly local because this is uh, the most restrictive notion of locality I'm going to use. What does it mean to be local? Well, okay, uh, it means that they can be written as Lagrangian densities, more or less, uh, integrated over uh, the whole manifold or some region. So let's see. So we have uh, some function which depends on the jet of the metric. The jet of the metric is uh, the value of the metric and all these derivatives uh, up to order k at a given point. And this f has to be compactly supported. And, and this is what ruins everything, okay? Because uh, if m is non-compact, there has to be something compactly supported for this whole thing to make sense, but this support is where it is. So if we apply a diffeomorphism to it, then it is somewhere else. So these guys cannot really sensibly be uh, diffeomorphism invariant if M is non-compact. Okay, so this is the statement. So the strict locality is clearly in conflict with diffeomorphism invariant. And what we want uh, in GR or in quantum gravity, we want to keep that diffeomorphism invariance. So Ted was saying yesterday that this, was, this is really crucial to have diff invariant observables in uh, that matter. So we should maybe better uh, take this question seriously. Okay, so here are the proposals which I want to mention. So one is the one I want to focus on, uh, and uh, Philip is going to say something more about those as well. So this is the relational observables. And the other, which I would probably not have time to say anything, but I can happily say something in the discussion, is the dressed observable, so what uh, Steve was talking about before. Okay, uh, so before I jump into these relational guys, I just want to make a small remark. So this idea of you know, locality in that sense is really restrictive and not necessary in many cases. So one can imagine something less restrictive, a weaker notion of locality, which is as follows. So well, later on, you will see that what I'm actually using in practice is not the action, but rather its derivatives. So I'm interested really in how the action uh, behaves under variations. That's, okay, classically it's clear, right? Because it's the variational uh, calculus that gives the equations of motion and so on. Quantum, I hope it becomes clearer by the end of that talk. 
Okay, so what I need really from that functional is that its derivatives at the point are compactly supported and local in uh, the same sense, okay? So uh, I will propose a weaker notion of locality is that um, all derivatives of my uh, functional of my classical observables are local at each point. Now, they could be local and supported elsewhere depending on the point. So this, this, is, this doesn't say anything about global support or about global bound of how many derivatives do I want to include. This can change. Okay, and it turns out that this weaker locality is actually sufficient if I want to run perturbative renormalization in the sense of Epstein-Glaser. So Epstein-Glaser renormalization is my favorite renormalization scheme. Uh, not really well known, so if you want to ask about it, I'm happy to answer in the discussion. So it's based on position space and, uh, well, okay, again, I'm a mathematician. It's mathematically rigorous, so I like it. Um, <laughs> yes. So, what's an example of something that satisfies this kind of this weaker locality, but Splendid. not Splendid. Yes, that's a very good question. So, uh, I can spoil some of, of the punchline. So, uh, with particular choice of relational observables, this would be the case. So, I will show you the examples and non-examples. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let's do it. Let's construct those observables. Um, I'm doing it classically, and then let's see how much I can quantize in five minutes. Um, right. So, okay, relational observables, they have to somehow describe relations between uh, classical fields, and maybe let's make it more uh, restrictive. We probably want them to describe relations between local fields, but uh, let's see. So, how do I think of it? Okay. So we want to define a coordinate system, and we want to define it uh, dynamically. So we want to define it using uh, some fields we have in the model. So, uh, okay. So let's assume that we can find ourselves four scalars, which uh, then parameterize points of space time. So to each point we can, at each point we can evaluate those four scalars. We get a number, numbers are good, and then, uh, well, they would label our points of space times for the purpose of other observables so that they know where they are. So that's relational observables. Uh, how do they transform at, under DFIOS? Well, that's easy, right? So these are uh, scalar fields. So if I uh, now uh, compose with a DFIO from the right, what it does, okay, you can do all the maths. Uh, this actually pulls back the metric by the DFO. Okay, so that's probably clear to everyone who knows GR. Uh, so, okay, so th that is general, okay? You can always do it. I mean, okay. Sometimes uh, if your metric is too symmetric and you don't have matter fields, it might turn out that uh, you cannot find such scalars. That can happen, so that there's the risk. But on the generic background, uh, you can probably do it in some neighborhood, at least in restricted sense, so uh, I can just hope for the best. Okay, uh, now perturbatively, it's even better. So let's fix the background for a moment uh, and try to find good coordinates for, for the background and be happy about it. So let's try to find the background which is not too symmetric. Okay, and then we do perturbative uh, theory, so we consider a small perturbation, so the whole metric is G0 plus the perturbation, and if we don't go very far from the background, then our coordinates are still good. So what do I do now? Uh, I want to do something crazy, so here I take my coordinate system on the background, I use it to go to R4, I have my label, now I take the map I used to define my coordinates, I go back to space-time, so here, okay, I'm in space-time, I go to R4, I go back to space-time with the same coordinates, but now evaluated at the full metric, not just at G0. So, 
So this is uh, this is the, the key thing I'm going to use to define relational observables. And this little guy transforms very nicely under deformorphisms. So again, uh, I can pull back G by uh, a diffio, and it turns out that this guy, okay, again, you can do the maths, uh, transforms with the inverse of my diffio, which sits now on the left. So this is something which is going to cancel the deformorphism transformation if I compose this guy with something else in my uh, theory. Okay, so this alpha is now the, defo the inverse deformorphism generator in my uh, story. Okay, <clears throat> so now I take another local field. Now, this, this can be strictly local. This can be the most stupid field I have in my theory, okay? Uh, and it should better be a scalar because they transform nicely. Uh, and then compose it with this alpha g, okay? So with this combination of uh, the, the coordinate changes. So this is now diff invariant. Why? Well, the scalar itself <coughs> transforms with the diffio from the right, and this transforms with the inverse diffio from the left. So they cancel. So I have a diff invariant observable, which is terribly non-local by now. But let's try to uh, see what we can do with it. Uh, just let's, let's maybe reiterate first uh, why do I call them relational observables and why it makes sense to do so. So uh, first of all, they are configuration-dependent coordinates. Now, this first bit, uh, so using this as a map from R4 to uh, this is my, my space time, uh, corresponds to taking the value of that local field provided that all these four fields have value y, right? So um, at the point where all these fields have given values, I evaluate ag, relational observable, as it should. Okay, yes. Are the fields X supposed to be dynamical in the end? Yeah, yes, okay. so this yeah. G dependence, I mean, they're dynamical from the beginning. I mean, yeah. classical gravity where G is the variable. Okay. Uh, right? Oh, sorry, or, you know, would you think of them as being something like a dynamical scalar field then, or? Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, they are, they are functionals or of the metric, right? So they are, uh, the metric is dynamical. Yeah. So they are dynamic. Oh, so they're simply functionals of the metric. Now okay. we are classical. Yes, they are. Okay. Then I don't know which. Yeah. Uh, what is what is being functionals of the metric in a complicated way? Well, I mean, what's what's non simply? Well, okay. So you might imagine two different things. One is to put in some explicit variables, uh, initially classical, mm. later quantum, that that are basically clock variables. You know, say an inflaton oh. field that changes over time, and that tells you what time it is. That's one thing. Yeah. Or you could try to make a functional of the metric. I think if you do the latter, yeah. and in fact this construction, it starts to look kind of like the dressed observable. Yeah, that's, what, that's what I think. I think, oh, I think okay. this um, really uh, contains both. So at the moment I'm being agnostic about it. It can be both, in fact. It can be both uh, extra uh, fields, extra scalars or whatever, or it can be intrinsic things coming from the metric. So I think in the end it's both. Okay, so the people I wanted to mention here who did this kind of game in uh, canonical quantization of, of gravity, so this would be Carlo Rovelli who really uh, is into these relational observables, Bianca Dietrich and Thomas Thiemann. So they have uh, their own rendering of the idea of relational observables in uh, loop quantum gravity, so in canonical quantization. Okay, but I'm not going to talk about it because I'm not an expert in loop quantum gravity, so I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, the concept, I think, is the same. All right. Uh, so here is an example of what we do with it. Uh, so again, I have this uh, composite uh, object, which is now non-local. Uh, it depends on a space-time point. I can... Um, integrated with some compactly supported test density, and hey, here goes my diff invariant observable. So this is the main hero of the story. Now, let's try to do some examples very quickly. Uh, oh, uh, I promised to relate to what I said at the beginning. 
So when do these guys are weakly non-local? So when do they satisfy these local derivatives um, property? This is if all these x's and all these a's are local fields themselves. So if they are local uh, scalars constructed from whatever you have in the model. Uh, so there is a lot of those. Good, so let's look at some examples. On generic backgrounds, we can use some metric scalars, so some traces involving uh, the Ricci. Uh, there are more examples which uh, go back to Bergman and Bergman and Comer. Uh, you can also use the dust fields or whatever other matter fields you have in the model. So this is, for example, the brown Kuhash model or the really stupid model of four scalar fields coupled to the metric. So why not? Okay. Um, and for an example of such observables in cosmology, there is my paper with a lot of people, Brunetti, Fren, Hagen, Hagen, Pinamonti, uh, on cosmological perturbation theory. So, yes. Library, yeah. functions? Yes. In the previous slide, when you're using the smearing functions, what, what status do they have? Because, I, I mean, are they not almost like coordinates in the sense that I could take a smearing function, which is... This, 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 F, this has absolutely no status. I mean, what has a status is, is this guy. So the coordinates is defined by those x's. The f is just uh, a mathematical convenience not to have things localized, uh, well, in mathematical sense as a point. So, so this is like uh, if you have smeared a uh, scalar field, smeared with a test function, this is that test function. So it's not really uh, crucial. Yes, please. But this construction depends explicitly on the reference matrix. Yes. You cannot go very far. You cannot go too far, no. No, that, that would be a good idea, no. So, so this is really perturbative. The statements I'm making are perturbative. Now, um, the first slide where I said, okay, you can choose these coordinates uh, for G, where G is the full metric, uh, in principle, you know, you could try to do something more intelligent and look for some neighborhood in the space of metrics where a given set of coordinates works. So classically, you can actually try to attack this problem non-perturbatively. It's not an easy problem, but you can try to do it. Um, but okay, I mean, for quantization, I don't really know how to do it fully non-perturbatively. I have some ideas how to do it partially perturbatively. Okay, so here are the examples. Uh, and there are also some works by Markus Prüb and collaborators uh, where he essentially, I mean, it's very similar to, to this uh, concept. Uh, so they are uh, going forward with this idea of applying such observables to, to cosmology. So uh, you can have a look. Uh, okay, so that's, that's most of what I wanted to say about observables themselves. Now I want to say just a few words about uh, how one could potentially quantize them. So uh, this is now some advertising. Uh, so what's perturbative AQFT? Uh, that's, that's my research field, but that doesn't tell you much. So uh, this is a sort of combination of uh, this rigorous uh, ideas of, of Rudolf Haag and Dutch Bright quantum field theory and perturbative methods. So two things which normally wouldn't be in the same room. Uh, but okay, they work together. Uh, so main contribut on contributions and the main contributors actually. Let me mention some names so that it doesn't look like it's all my work. Uh, so it starts with some ideas from deformation quantization. Uh, so there were very clever people who knew how to use it well. So there is a combination of names, Brunetti, Dutch friend, Hagen in 2000. Uh, now, so this works for free theory. For interaction, you have to use uh, some randomization. So I already advertised my favorite Epstein-Glaser randomization, which is not that new, but still good. So it uh, goes back to 70, 70s paper of Epstein-Glaser. Finally, more recent thing, which surprisingly didn't happen until uh, lately, is generalization to gauge theories. 
and there was the uh, pioneer work of, of Holland in 2008, and there was uh, the full generalization of that uh, also to gravity, my work with Fred Hagen, 2011. So actually more recent than this whole framework is. Okay, and now I have to do advertising, because why not? Uh, I wrote a book about it, so if you want to learn even more about it than you can in the next five minutes, uh, then there is that. So perturb perturbative AQFT introduction for mathematicians. This sounds off-putting, I know, but uh, I, some of it is understandable, I'm sure. Uh, good. So uh, what do I mean here by constructing a model? You give me a space-time. Uh, it should better have a Cauchy surface because I really like Cauchy surfaces. So it has to be globally hyperbolic. Although I, I, kind of, I guess that you could also do something more adventurous. So uh, ADS should go as well. But you have to convince me of that. Uh, okay, the space of fields you want to study. So space of configurations. These are for the moment off shell. So for the scalar field, it's just some smooth functions. For gravity, it's covariant to tensors. And finally, uh, some dynamics. Uh, and I really like Lagrangian formalism. I'm sorry, uh, some of you prefer Hamiltonian. I guess it's the matter of choice you do early in your life, and then it stays this way. Uh, so I use a covariant version of Lagrangian formalism. So uh, this is where I am. And how do we do it? OK, so as I said, we start with classical observables, which I call here f, uh, and they are, everything is off shell for now. So they are functions of arbitrary field configurations. Uh, classical dynamics, I use uh, the method of payers to construct the covariant bracket, and the input I need for that is um, the difference between retarded and advanced green functions. So this is something very globally hyperbolic, very Lorentzian, uh, has a lot of causality information in it. Uh, this is really crucial for this framework. Uh, but OK, if you have some nice green functions on your space time and uh, you can construct a similar thing, then I'm more than happy. Um, so there is you know, low, uh, low bar for uh, making this work. Uh, and you can see that this has as an input first derivatives of these functionals. So derivatives count. OK. Uh, then to get a quantum theory of that, I want to use a uh, magic called deformation quantization, which is something that mathematicians thought of because they wanted to understand quantization. Uh, so what is it for a mathematician quantization? Hey, you have your Poisson algebra, right? You have your bracket, and then you want to construct some crazy product so that things don't commute anymore. And there is some parameter h bar, and when it's zero, then this product becomes commutative, and the commutator goes to your bracket. That's like a really, you know, you look at all these quantization business and you think, well, this is what it is, right? So uh, forgetting about all the intricacies. Uh, so, okay, so that's what I want to do. I want to construct the product of that sort. Uh, so what's important? Important is that I work with the same vector space. My vector space is what it is from the beginning. I found my different variant observables, and I'm going to work with them. So what I change now is the product, from commutative product of classical observables to a quantum product. And in quantum, I mean that it's non-commutative and depends on this parameter h bar. What I also mean by it, it actually works, and it gives the same result as whatever other quantization scheme you think of. Now, you might be slightly suspicious because this thing kind of like takes care of the ordering problem. What happened to the ordering problem? Well, the ordering is actually the choice of this product. So uh, there are different choices. There is the vile moyal product. There is the Vig product. And then they correspond to different orderings. All right. So that's that's part of the punchline, the same vector space. Now, I have to kind of watch my time. Uh, we started a bit late, but uh, how long should I go on without being too? Well, how much more do you think you need? Five minutes. Perfect. All right, so five minutes to complete the quantization. Fantastic. OK, so uh, I will now 
start with quadratic action because harmonic oscillator is what we understand, full stop. Uh, so I assume that I have nice equations like the wave equation. Wave equation is fantastic. And now having that, I can construct my green functions, so this funny guy delta. And now with using some little extra magic, I can construct a nice product. So this works in uh, quadratic actions. This works for free theory. Happiness, it works for free theory. I, I quantize free scalar field. OK, uh, so, uh, but I'm not happy with that yet. Uh, this, is, this is not the top of, of my ambition. So I want to introduce the interaction. So here is the machinery. I take some interaction term, some functional in the space of local uh, functional, so a local interaction. And then I construct another crazy object, which is the formal S matrix. Now, I'm not pretending that this is understandable at this level, but uh, okay, we know, I think here, what's an S matrix. We are in CERN. This is the place which is made for studying those things. Uh, formal S matrix is something which kind of should approximate the S matrix, the physical S matrix, in appropriate limit. So uh, construct that, and from that, I construct interacting fields using something like, um, well, you can think of it uh, as the Dyson series for the interacting fields. So a bit of cheating. I mean, this is a bit more story behind it. But so the input here is I have to be able to construct time-ordered products. This is what my renomization scheme is doing for me. Having done that, I can plug this into, whoops, into this formula, which uh, if you stare at it very, very uh, long, then you realize, well, yes, this is the Dyson series, so of course it works. Uh, and, and this is how from a given uh, classical functional, I get some object in this crazy quantum algebra, which I will call now interacting observable. OK, we are almost there. Uh, so these are my interacting observables. Done. Uh, now, this would be all very stupid if I didn't have any states, any way to compare all this algebra to actual numbers. So in algebraic approach, states are functionals on this uh, quantum algebra, which are normalized to one and positive. If I want a Hilbert space, and I do want it sometimes, you know, there is nothing bad with Hilbert spaces. Uh, I use the GNS theorem. So there is one-to-one -one correspondence between such states and Hilbert space representations. Brilliant. OK. On this space of functionals, there are many, many beautiful states. It's full of states. I can take any solution to dynamical equations, evaluate my functional at that point, and get a number. So for the scalar field, I could just take 0. 0 is good. Uh, it is a good solution to the, the free equations. So I can construct a state, define the state. There is not much to be done as evaluation. And here is something great, OK? So if I do that for my product of smeared fields, I recover the endpoint functions. Uh, so that has all the information about the free theory. And now I can also compute the correlators for the interacting fields, the same method, OK? I have my machinery for producing interacting uh, observables. I plug them in. Then I take the product evaluated at 0. I get a number. So this is how we compute correlation functions. Well, if yes. If doing yes, this can all go on curved backgrounds. in this star. So, so this, this uh, we have to go back a bit. So here I said something very vague. So uh, I have canonically given a delta, which is retarded minus advanced green functions. And uh, the choice of the state is the choice of polarization on the configuration space. So somehow um, I want to introduce a complex structure on the configuration space, which means uh, in practical terms, I add symmetric parts to this and use this for deformation. I can elaborate on that longer. But uh, 
the non-uniqueness of uh, the choice of states on curved space time corresponds to non-uniqueness in defining that product. But it's not a terrible non-uniqueness. Okay, let me table that. Uh, I can come back to that uh, later because it is an important point, but it is also a bit technical point. Yes. Yeah, but 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 I mean the choice of the state on curved space time also is related to the choice of ordering. Yes, but you mean the choice of the set of states, or do you mean the choice of the particular states? It's I mean it's really a class of states. Okay, so that's the so stars are the choice of the class of states. Yeah. I, I uh, what, what were you? Uh, is this answering your question, or were you asking about something else? Uh, it's unclear to me. Uh, but we can. You put it on the table, so we'll. Uh, yeah, it's it. it's it's here. Okay, I can I can I can talk about it for an hour, but feel it would kill me. So I don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the conference, that would be embarrassing. Okay, so uh, but I'm almost done. So what about gravity? So just just the final punchline. Okay. So, uh, some self-advertising. I can do all of that for non-local functionals with local derivatives. I don't have to assume locality. This notion is enough. So I can do it from my relational observables. Uh, okay, I have to do that split of the metric and then uh, somehow extract the quadratic part of the interaction relative to that metric. So that's disappointing. However, in the perturbative sense, so in the neighborhood. Uh, this is independent of the choice. This sounds a bit suspicious, so let me just explain it. Maybe just one word about it, okay? So uh, the thing is that I can define myself uh, an interacting product, which is the twist of my free product. Uh, algebraically, this is just some crazy combinatorics. This interacting product does not depend on that split. Okay, so the combinatorics of that completely forgets about the fact that I split things into uh, free and interacting. And this is elaborated on in my paper with Eli Hawkins, which you can find on the archive. Uh, there could be potentially some obstructions while I do renormalization. Uh, so one has to prove some word identities to see that uh, this independence is not broken along the way. Um, but it's a step into the right direction, I think, because uh, there is an algebraic structure which is background independent, at least perturbatively, it's all perturbative, uh, and there are observables. So, okay, thank you very much for your attention. Further questions? There's, there's something very odd with this problem of getting different morphism invariant observables, which is that in practice, if I want to describe or think of a neutron star evolving or a black hole evolving, I have no difficulty at all. I just take a coordinate frame, put my fields in there, and that's it. Yes, and that's, it seems that's to make good. sense. Yes. So now the problem is, why, does it, why is it not a problem for me? Because it should be. I, I, Why is but it, but, but I, it looks as if you can des describe a system, whatever system you are uh, interested in, and it looks as if you can get away with it without ever, ever bothering about your problem. But that, that can't be right. I mean, uh, I think you should be bothered. And in a sense, you know, this choice of uh, relational observables, you can think of it as choosing your reference frame. And in some approximation, this reference frame can be treated as non-dynamical. So if you're doing your experiments here at CERN, you don't really worry about the fact that you should be looking at relational observables, right? Uh, but you don't worry because uh, within the scales you are looking at, if you compare the scales of what you're measuring and the scales of this whole beautiful lab, uh, these background uh, coordinates, you can treat them as fixed. 
So I think uh, there is no, no tension between have to, that. But, hmm? but that is easy because we can think of gravitational waves getting hmm. going through this lab and, and things shake about. And we can describe all that. Yes, but they so don't. Yes. But, but this so is again, again, we seem to not, not to encounter a problem. And uh, as, as you observe, we really should be getting a problem. So. Well, okay, gravitational waves is again a perturbation. So you're uh, still in the perturbation regime where those perturbations are not um, very big. I mean, okay, uh, measuring gravitational waves as such wasn't trivial and you have to make an effort. Now, uh, measuring quantum effects of gravitational waves, um, I, well, okay, I don't want to say anything about it, but uh, I think that really the question is uh, the choices of scales and the choices of uh, what do you call the observer, what do you call the coordinate system. And uh, if you forget about uh, the fact that you have to be in a diff invariant theory, you can just fix those uh, fields X as an external observer. But so can you can just work in that frame. I can imagine some sort of infrared limit that they say, okay, the things that I don't touch are the walls of this building, mm -hmm. or you know, yes. the tunnel in which this accelerated yes. city. Everything else, That's perfect. everything else is uh, is moving around. Yes, but uh, uh, but then I, we can think of taking the limit that this tunnel is very very large, mm -hmm. so that uh, in practice it never gives me any problem. But very good. Yes, I mean, I think it depends what how you take your limit and what you're interested in measuring. I, I, don't, I don't think you would see quantum gravity effects when uh, colliding the particles in CERN and the energies which are available at the moment and in the kind of experimental setup we are looking at. I don't think you can. Uh, so you have to make some sort of uh, effort to design an experiment where you actually can see uh, quantum gravity effects. At the same time, we know that quantum gravity effects in some indirect sense are important because to explain the experiment, we need a standard model, but the standard model is not really understood because we are not taking gravity effects into account, and so we have all these 26 or more adjustable numbers. Mm. So we end up having difficulties. Yeah, but so the, the question now is to sort, sort out these difficulties, to solve them. Do we need to know how big the tunnel is in which the accelerator takes, uh, is sitting? I think we always need to know what idealizations we are making when describing yeah. experiment using models. I mean, each model has to be thought of, uh, you know, in the regime it applies to. And I think we should all, as quantum field theorists, be aware of idealizations we are making. Which, I mean, I, I love quantum field theory. I think it's great. I, I do quantum field theory. This is quantum field theory. There, it's, it's not really doing quantum gravity. It's doing quantum field theory as far as you can get. So, um, yeah, it's just, uh, just pointing out how this extends to possible um, diffeomorphism invariant formulation, that you can use quantum field theory for diff invariant formulation to some extent. So can we add something to this question? Yes, because this is your talk now. <laughs> no, so um, actually there's two things one can say about it. And first of all, if you're interested in the dynamics in a given space time, and then, in, of course, in classically, there's not really a problem in using coordinates to see what happens to an observer falling into a black hole. Um, you can always make these statements actually diffeomorphism invariant if you work with um, you know, proper times and so on, and you would take care of um, specifying from where to where a world line goes in terms of space-time coincidences. And then the numbers you would get out, they would be exactly what you get in terms well, of coordinates. In the beginning, you said a given space-time. Yeah, so, um, what does that mean? Because where can I find that space-time? Yeah, so by a given space-time, I mean a solution to the Einstein equations, but uh, the diffeomorphism equivalence class of that, basically. So and you can pick any representative of that, um, and then uh, um, in that representative, you can compute these numbers. And if you do that in, a, in terms of these coincidences, um, then what you will find is that these uh, relations that you get there don't depend on the, on the representative of the equivalence class, and then they are actually morphism invariant. But then another thing why these um, uh, relational observables are important for quantum gravity is because when you do non-perturbative quantizations of, um, of uh, these space-times and you get superpositions of space-time, then you know, coordinates are usually attached to a particular space-time. We you now have positions of, uh, superpositions of space-times, then it's difficult to talk about any notion of classical coordinates. And so 
Um, classical coordinates are useful for studying dynamics in space-time. These relational observables are actually useful for studying dynamics of space-time. Okay, and that also account for localization when, uh, when you quantize geometries plus matter. Mm -hmm. Now I wanted to come back to the question on the table. So sure. I really don't get that. I mean, uh, or do we want to uh, allow Philip to give his talk? I, I don't know what's the schedule. Well, or should we uh, degenerate into discussion? If we have generated a certain amount of discussion, maybe we should continue a bit of this. We don't okay. want to go too far. But there are some uh, questions. So. This is wonderful. Okay, so <laughs> that really has a delay. This is, this is just so impossible. Um, so normally I think of the commutation relations for, let's say, a free field operator on a curved background uh, that's globally hyperbolic. It's mm -hmm. just coming from uh, with not requiring any choice beyond um, anything, really. I mean, I just do canonical commutation relations of the operator. But you were saying somehow the star product has a further choice in it it's going to encode the polarization yes. in the phase space and therefore affect the quantization, or Let affect the choice of state at least, that, that's the natural description of the state. So that's yeah. what I don't get. How can a product encode a polarization when all can it I is... Try? Can I try? Can I do it in five minutes? Yes. What you call positive and negative frequency. Yeah, negative. yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, yeah so but normally the commutation relations are independent of that choice, and you're saying the star product... May I, may I try to answer it very quickly? Okay, Please. so... Okay, so here is what gives me the commutation relations. This is the anti-symmetric part. This is this retarded minus advanced, okay? Now, I can add to it, so I take this. This, this fixes me commutation relations once and forever. I add to it symmetric part, which doesn't change commutation relations. Okay, and I now take the product, which can depend on the choice of the symmetric part as the exponential product with, uh, how do I do it? Well, okay, let's do it like this, phi 1, phi 2, f of phi 1, g of phi 2, evaluated at the same point. So this is just the Moyal product. Okay, now let's let's look at the commutator. So the commutator minus minus g star f. So the the zero part cancels because it's commutative, uh, and the first order term is now d f over d phi. And here I have I delta plus H D G over D phi plus the anti-symmetrization. So plus the anti-symmetrization, which kills this one because it's fully symmetric. So the only anti-symmetric bit is plus higher order. So I get from this D F over, oh, I should, oh my God, I should add those, you know, things. H bar, sorry. <laughs> Always forgetting one. about those. Yeah, H bar is, is one is equal to equal. <laughs> I'm using, uh, using the best convention ever. Okay. Um, and there's the stupid factor of I. Okay. The H over D. Fine. So that's the commutator. The commutator is fixed by the geometry of space-time, full stop, this is it. Now, this freedom of adding symmetric part just affects how the product looks like, so how the correlation functions look like. So, uh, ooh, the wrong one, ah, it's always the wrong one. Uh, so if I compute, uh, let's say this, for two smeared fields, evaluate at zero, then I only extract uh, the, the, the first order part, so I get F, W, G. So that's the two-point function. The W is then the two-point function. 
Yes. So in the, in the vacuum situation in uh, Minkowski space-time, I would take this to be the, two point, the, the Whiteman two-point function. Now, Steve said something about positive and negative frequencies. Well, this is exactly what it does. So uh, this W, you can think of as positive frequency part of delta. So this is how you choose your, very abstractly, this is how you choose your positive frequencies. Just a really quick question. So when you say the symmetric part, so this is the part that's built out of uh, things that are in the kernel of the Dalimbertian, right? Uh, yes. Okay, yeah. So, that, so by changing around the symmetric part, now that's where we're playing through, that's where we're playing with like the zero mode. Um, I mean, um, yeah. I, it's, okay, so, so there is this. There is also uh, a fact that uh, these various choices of age lead to isometric, uh, sorry, um, isomorphic <laughs> algebras. So, uh, and I'm an AQFT person. So everything which is the same up to an isomorphism is the same. So it's really, from the point of view of the algebra of observables, as per Rudolf Hag, this is the same. And now, uh, okay, the number you get here is not the same. And the number you get here is um, then uh, the two-point function of the state you have chosen. Uh, but this you can also kind of fix on this level, so you can uh, find, for each edge you can find the state which will give you the same number. You can take back that transformation. Is, did you have other questions? Oh. Splendid, okay. okay. Uh, actually, one other question, uh, and that is, when you try to describe relational observables like this and think about them as defined in terms of uh, dynamical fields, you know, mm. like these yeah. the kind of silly ones like an evolving scalar field, but those are useful because they are simple. Uh, you know, there are a couple of uh, things that are puzzling. Mm -hmm. yeah. One is that they uh, really don't give you anything that clearly resembles a local algebra. Uh, it, let me just, I'll mention the two things. And, you know, in in the actual you know, local quantum field theory, we do have local algebra. So there's a question of you know, what kind of structure do you have uh, th if things are fundamentally defined this way. Mm -hmm. The second question, or the second maybe issue, is that they don't really localize things uh, as well as you might have aspired to uh, if you're naive, uh, because if you're trying to say localize things with respect to a scalar field, but mm -hmm. that scalar field is a dynamical scalar field that's fluctuating, then its ability to localize things is limited. Uh, and so that's connected to the first thing. Uh, so, so there are sort of lim limitations on localization mm. that are intrinsic if mm. you have a, you know, a dynamical uh, quantum variable which is serving as your clock. And so I don't know if you have any further thoughts or comments on that, but you know, since relational observables appear to be an important part of the fundamental definition of <coughs> the uh, quantum theory with observables, and since we run into these limitations, that seems rather interesting. So mm. Yeah, so the first question, I mean, uh, yeah, this is exactly the problem I want to study. So uh, it's clear that it has to... Uh, generalize the usual AQFT way of thinking about things. I do hope that one can still stay within certain concepts of AQFT. Now, this, this product I defined at the end, this interacting product. Well, so this is the algebraic structure that these observables obey. So this is how I can multiply them. Uh, this, I, this is how I can compute their correlators. So uh, part of my interest is to understand this product and understand uh, you know, w what does it actually mean, okay? So try to see what sort of generalization of AQFT I need um, to make, make this a part of it. Uh, now, the interpretational question, because I think that's the second question, um, this is maybe related to some discussions I, I had with Laurent Friedel in a Perimeter. So he has this idea of thinking of quantizing the observer. So... Uh, he takes this uh, idea of choosing uh, the reference frame seriously, and then he goes and quantizes it. And this is, this is very much related to this idea of relational observables as the choice of this xg, xg0. 
because this is the choice of the frame. I mean, I'm choosing the frame, and what I'm doing, well, I'm quantizing it, right? So you can think of it a bit like quant trying to quantize the observer, uh, <laughs> trying to quantize the reference frame. So um, this is probably the way to, you know, access the interpretation of those. But again, uh, I d this is not really 100% worked out at the moment, but I, I would think towards that direction, that we have to, you know, bite the bullet and quantize the observer. I guess Sean would say he or she is already quantized. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, we are just trying to find out, you know. We're trying to rediscover this from completely the wrong direction. I know. The world is quantum. I believe it 100%. It's just I'm too stupid to understand it. <laughs> okay. We should probably go on. But this, anyway, I think that's a good set of questions to think about. So, but uh, let's continue with uh, Philip. Um, it's probably good to, um, right. Can you hear me? Ah, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, uh, I don't know why my slides don't show up. Um, This is your computer, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Um, <laughs> Let's call it a restart. So I think it's currently on v VGA. Yeah, I just don't see that at the moment, even under Sorry, system. References, show mirroring options in the menu bar when available. Arrangement. Is it here? Ah, okay. And uh, mirror displays. Ah, sorry. Yeah, I think I've, got, I've got to get the right switches going. I think it was this one, yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, okay. Right but now, then. Okay, let me try again. It didn't quite improve the situation, but. Yeah. Um, Lost everyone with projector expertise. Not the zero. Uh, sorry about that. So what happened to the projector? Well, um, you, one has to figure out the right combination of buttons <coughs> to push, yeah. and I probably pushed the wrong combination. So. <laughs> so, but it should be laptop so VGA going, actually. Yeah, so okay. let's try that again. But right now it's not even showing the room, oh, you can see, no. which is a little odd. <coughs> oh. Oh, there has something showing. It's light. There you go. Ah, okay. So that's that. That's the room computer, I guess. Yeah. Okay, so we don't want. Now we will be able to see your email. No, it's not. Uh, uh, that's not my computer. <laughs> somebody's email. Yeah, no, it's. Um, I think they've made it here technically the maximally confusing yeah. and, uh, with a blackboard and uh, There we go. <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's not worry. <laughs> got one more. Uh, Hopefully, it'll replace the one up. Just ignore this for now. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, also for this nice workshop. Um, yeah, so when you see the title here, um, you might wonder what this has <laughs> to do with uh, gravitational observables. That's what the session was supposed to be about. 
Um, but indeed, what I will talk about is something more general than just uh, gravitational observables, but it will have in particular something to say about relational observables, namely how they transform when you change the reference system. And so that also goes back, I think, to a question that came from the audience. So we've seen, as Cassia explained to you, that you use dynamical degrees of freedom, and basically you use those to localize other degrees of freedom. And now the question is, what happens if you, if you switch quantum reference systems? And this is a question that is more general. It's also of interest in quantum foundations. Um, recently, there has been a lot of attention given to this. And so, um, yeah, I will try to tell you a bit about what the quantum architecture is that is necessary in order to try to make sense out of a quantum notion of general covariance that is um, a notion that allows you to uh, switch, basically, quantum reference frames. And essentially, all of what I will say is uh, in these references here, if you're more interested in it. Um, Augustin Faridfeld was a master's student who I supervised in Vienna, and then Flaminia Giacomini and Esteban Castro Ruiz were also uh, their PhD students in Vienna. Okay, um, since I don't have very much time, I will also start, first of all, with uh, some general remarks and the scheme and conceptual uh, topics, and then later on I will try to, if I have some time, to explain you what some of these things mean more explicitly and illustrate that. So let me start with a bit of prehistory. So there's, in, um, in the surrounding the discussion of the problem of time in canonical quantum gravity or sort of uh, quantum cosmology, there's um, a facet of it that's called usually the multiple choice problem. What is that? Um, that's the problem that in generic general relativistic systems, there are no distinguished choices of internal times or relational clocks. And then there have been arguments that if you choose different um, relational clocks or internal times with respect to which you describe time evolution, that that would give you inequivalent quantum dynamics. So in fact, even unitarily inequivalent quantum dynamics. And so just a very simple example is, uh, for instance, in, in cosmology, suppose you have now a scale, a scale of field in the Friedman universe, you could, for instance, uh, pick, you could evolve the scale factor relative to the scalar field, or you might also want to do it the other way around. Classically, it's not so difficult to relate these two, but in the quantum theory, the question is, how would you do this when these objects actually become operators? And so, um, Kare Kukash, um, in his review on the problem of time, he made a statement about this multiple choice problem, saying that it's a, it's a problem of an embarrassment of riches out of many inequivalent options one does not know which one to select. And also that uh, the question whether any of these different choices would actually give you the correct uh, quantum dynamics. And then uh, Chris Isham in his review said, uh, or raised the question whether actually all these different quantum theories relative to different re internal clock choices could be seen as part of an overall scheme that is covariant. And he also said, well, that it's unlikely that a single Hilbert space could be used for all these different quantum dynamics. And indeed, um, what I confirm in this work is um, basically what Aishan was saying. You can embed uh, these uh, different quantum dynamics, in fact, in, uh, in a quantum covariant scheme. And indeed, you need a lot of different Hilbert spaces to make sense out of this. Um, but this is, will also thereby give a way of, of, of solving this uh, multiple choice problem to an extent. OK. Um, now, since this is about covariance, let me very briefly say a couple of things about general covariance. Of course, you all know what that is, but um, generally understood as the statement that all the laws of physics are the same in all reference frames. Um, that already tells us that there is actually some structure that is actually frame independent or that you could call frame neutral. Of course, physical laws are then uh, described by tensor equations. Tensors are actually frame independent objects, but they encode um, the physics that any reference frame would see because if you contract the tensors with whatever choice of reference frame you have, then that spits out numbers that possibly correspond to what an observer would measure. Um, but yeah, the main point is there's, there's in fact a reference frame neutral information encoded in these, uh, in these uh, tensors. And there's more reference frame neutral information. And basically what I want to um, tell you about is motivate to um, generalize some of these properties to a quantum theory. So, and technically when we try to make sense out of um, the statement here, then usually uh, in a given space time, what we do is we kind of idealize reference frames um, and basically treat them as external. Um, we might think of some spaceships going through space time, but in practice we would think of them really as uh, as vector frames on that space-time, um, ignoring that they might have any back reaction of space-time or internal dynamics. And then, um, and then you describe like this coordinate description, so you define them. So you have your space-time in the middle. Um, 
the physics happening in space time you can consider again as frame neutral. So for instance, if I make the statement that there's a bunch of billiard balls flying through space, then you don't need to specify a frame to make sense out of that statement. But if I want to say how fast they're moving, then I have to specify a frame. And then you can define, of course, these uh, coordinate descriptions of it, which you could interpret as a frame perspective for different observers. And now the main point here is, of course, you know all about uh, coordinate changes on a manifold, but what is nice about it is here that if you want to change the frame perspective, say from Alice to Bob, what you do is you basically invert the coordinate map, you go back via the frame neutral physics to the new, um, to the new perspective, and so there's this nice compositional uh, structure in, involved in, uh, in, in these frame changes. And so basically the reason I'm mentioning this is because I want to ask, can we have something similar when we actually take serious that reference frames are always physical systems and in fact also subject to the laws of quantum theory? And can we then also have such a perspective or frame neutral uh, superstructure and uh, also such a nice compositional structure in analogy to uh, coordinate changes on a manifold that will tell us how to change quantum perspectives? Yeah, so basically that will be uh, then the aim to make a sense out of general covariance when frames are quantum. Okay, so and that's the aim basically of this program to come up with a unifying framework um, that allows you to switch uh, both temporal and spatial uh, quantum reference systems. And well, just in a nutshell, what's the main idea? How can we achieve this? Well, we, we will use a symmetry principle in gravity, we get that for free. That's the diffeomorphism invariance, but you can also do it more generally in other systems. And that symmetry principle leads to a redundancy um, in the description of, of your degrees of freedom. Um, there's constraints, but there's also gauge invariance. And so this allows us to treat all dynamic degrees of freedom on an equal footing, including those of uh, whatever you want to choose as a reference frame. And then we're always free to pick um, what, um, you know, whatever uh, reference system we want, and then we always will consider those degrees of freedom uh, um, corresponding to the reference system as being the redundant ones, and that's because we don't want to describe the reference frame relative to itself. And that basically overall will give us a perspective neutral framework, um, perspective neutral because it encodes all different frame choices at once, and, uh, and, and by this perspective neutral framework, one can then switch perspectives. So let me give you in one slide here already um, what the upshot of this will be. I will then try to illustrate this in a, uh, in a particular explicit model because otherwise you will only understand schematically what's going on, but this is basically the main message to take away. So what will turn out to be the perspective neutral, the quantum reference system neutral uh, structure in the quantum theory, in the canonical formulation will be the physical Hilbert space. So that's the space of solutions to the constraints that arise from the gauge symmetry. In quantum gravity, that would be the space of solutions to the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. So this is the global Hilbert space where also the wave function of the universe will live in. Um, so that's the Dirac quantization. And then I will propose that you um, interpret the, basically the internal perspectives relative to different quantum systems um, as being uh, certain reduced uh, Hilbert spaces. So they are um, actually uh, classically gauge fixed um, quantizations. So this is reduced quantization. And now the tricky part is to actually relate the two because that's the relation between uh, Dirac quantization and reduced quantization. And already uh, Ted told you yesterday in this talk um, that there's been a lot of debate about the relation of these two <coughs> going back to the 80s. Indeed, in general, um, they are not fully equivalent and that's also why these maps here in the end, they will not be always globally defined, but uh, at least in, on, on subsets of this Hilbert space, um, you will be able to define them. So it's a bit like coordinates maps, they will not always be globally valid. But so this here is technically the main in, um, development of our work here is to figure out what these quantum symmetry reduction maps actually are that relate direct to reduced quantization. Um, so far I've only worked this out for finite dimensional systems, but the steps are completely general and they will also apply to field theory. Okay, so um, <coughs> yeah, so that will basically give you a scheme to, uh, to relate a global perspective on the physics that is basically before you choose a reference system to, in a sense, internal perspectives in the quantum theory. And then if you want to go and switch perspectives, you will have the same compositional structure as on coordinate changes on a manifold. It turns out that um, not always globally, you can invert uh, these symmetry reduction maps and then you go via the perspective neutral structure again, and then you map forward to a different quantum perspective. So 
Yeah, I'm just wondering, for the same scheme, but doing it for Yang-Mills theory or something, do you, uh, is there a result yes. that uh, there's complete equivalence between all reductions and it's global on the... Yeah, so it is, it is uh, the there will be, it depends on the choice of gauge that underlies the reduction here. Because if generally we have the Gribov problem, of course, that um, there's gauge choices. Okay, but that let's say for global gauges. Yeah, then, uh, then um, okay, with Young-Mills theory, whether they will be exactly equivalent, probably, they, probably yes. So, I mean, here I will illustrate you a model where it will be exactly equivalent. But, I mean, you can easily come up with other models where you can easily see that, in general, they're not fully equivalent. But, um, so that was the aim that I give you the simplest possible model I can cook up to illustrate that scheme, and then that one, it turns out to be globally uh, invertible. Um, right, and so actually one thing that we also encountered another question here a couple of times uh, during this workshop, uh, also for instance in Daniel Jeffers talk yesterday, um, so this question of suppose we now have this global state in our bulk quantum gravity theory in ADS, and, um, and then we would want to know what happens to an observer falling into the black hole. Maybe in the long run, this toolbox that I'm developing here uh, might give you a, a methodology to actually address that question. Of course, in practice, I wouldn't know how to do this because you would, first of all, have to be able to solve really the constraints uh, rigorously in, 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 in the bulk theory. Yeah, sorry, I think you have a question. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> yes, uh, um, yeah. I, I, yeah. Could you just, com I know you're going to give an example, but could you comment on what the reduced Hilbert space is? Is that <laughs> somehow I think I know what the Hilbert space is, but somehow the... Yeah, so that's basically the, it's the quantization of the classically reduced, uh, gauge fixed reduced Hilbert spaces. So what I will show you is basically that the, um, that so I will first of all illustrate it classically that basically choice of frame amounts to also choosing a gauge in, in, in your, on your constraint surface. And then um, you get a phase space structure out of it, a reduced phase space. And when you quantize that, you get these uh, Hilbert spaces. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe let me move on because uh, I might otherwise not make it through that example. So, but let me just say, uh, the other thing is why is that relevant now to the observables? I should probably say that. Because um, relational observables, they will be defined on this physical global Hilbert space here. But these maps here, it turns out they actually map correctly these uh, Dirac observables or these relational observables you have on the physical Hilbert space to correctly to the reduced uh, versions of them on the, on the reduced Hilbert spaces. And in particular, then you can also uh, use these maps here to to relate observables that are defined here to observables that are defined there, and in that way also translate between different kinds of relational observables. And this is also then um, how I would argue that this multiple choice problem isn't actually a problem, but it's a multiple choice feature. It's what you want to have that you have all these different uh, quantum theories. Um, the point is what I'm proposing that you can take all these different quantum dynamics and interpret them as being. Um, different descriptions of the same physics, but relative to different uh, quantum reference systems. And that structure, there has been a lot of debates. Should we only use uh, Dirac quantization or particular reduced quantizations uh, in the literature, also in quantum, uh, canonical quantum gravity? And also here the pr proposal that I'm making is that you should rather take the whole package of them. So not only Dirac quantization or only reduced quantization, but you need the whole package of all these different things to have a complete relational quantum theory that allows you to switch perspectives and that and thereby actually gives you a notion of quantum general covariance, so the ability to switch quantum perspectives. Okay, um, so I don't know how much time I have, so I could... Um, uh, Steve, uh, that was a skeptical look. <laughs> um, Let me ask the standard question. Well, probably 10 minutes or something. So something like this. So I mean, I mean, the thing is that, I mean, what I've said now is, will probably sound vague to most of you if you don't see an example of how this actually works. So that's why I want to pick the simplest example. Um, just a mechanical system. Main idea again is, okay, suppose we have now the symmetry principle, gauge symmetry canonically that leads to constraints. On the phase space, we have a constraint surface. And the constraint surface is not actually phase space itself. It's a pre-symplectic uh, manifold generally. So that we cannot really interpret as the description of physics relative to a particular reference frame. What we want is that um, frame perspectives classically uh, are really also um, are really phase-based descriptions. And, um, and there's, of course, also redundancy in this constraint surface, both due to the constraints. There's an algebraic redundancy there. 
And of course, due to the gauge symmetry as well, there's a redundancy in the variables. And, but the theory, of course, doesn't tell you which of these are redundant. That's a choice you have to make. And what I want to argue is that uh, the choice of reference frame basically amounts to choosing which uh, degrees of freedom you will uh, label as redundant and get rid of. And so in that sense, the constraint surface basically is perspective neutral and encodes all frame choices at once. So here is a very simple example. So you just pick, um, uh, so these are my three collaborators. I model them as uh, unit, uh, unit mass, uh, point particles in one dimension. That's terrible. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I explicitly didn't put myself here. Uh, but, um, so, um, so basically, a simple, simple idea, you pick the standard kinetic terms, subtract the energy of the, kinetic, uh, of the center of mass, translation invariant uh, potential, and then you can easily convince yourself that this is uh, globally translation invariant, so the action remains invariant, so that's the symmetry here. Basically what that means, the physics here is purely relative, so um, the localization in this Newtonian background space is physically relevant, it's only the relative motion that, uh, that counts here. Um, so time in this example here is absolute, okay? Um, and actually here, I will not really talk about relational observables, but relative observables, I should say, because it's easier here. So if you do a Legendre transformation to phase space, you get just the usual kind of Hamiltonian, plus here um, a constraint, of course, when you have gauge symmetries, you get a constraint. This constraint is simply the, the total momentum, has to vanish on solution, and it's easy to convince yourself that in the canonical theory, this guy is the generator of the, of the, uh, of the symmetries. Now, what about this redundancy that I talked about? Of course, due to the symmetry, the individual positions of the particles aren't actually physically relevant observables, but the relative distances are. It's clear that these commute uh, with, uh, with the uh, uh, constraints, the, the gauge generator, and also it's obvious that these uh, momenta are, um, are observables. Now, um, so yeah, they're Poisson commute with the constraints. So in this year, now, this is, I, why is that also perspective neutral description? Because actually here, I, um, uh, I mean, there's a redundancy here clearly in, in this description, because I mean, for instance, the, the, the last relative observer is just the difference between these two. And then of course, also the momenta are not independent due to the constraints. Um, in the end, we have only four independent gauge invariant observables. Which ones those are, that's up to you to choose. And I will argue that, um, you have, that it's basically equivalent to choosing a reference frame. And um, let me explain a bit more. So how do we go from this perspective neutral structure with a redundancy to the perspective of a frame where we don't want to have redundancy anymore and just have a reduced phase space? First thing is you choose your reference system. Suppose we take Augustin. Then the next thing is um, you have to do a gauge choice here in your, that cuts your constraint surface. So it leads you to some intersection. Um, and uh, here in this example, for instance, suppose we pick A's perspective, we can just define his position to be the origin of that system um, that's dynamically consistent. And if you do this, then the gauge invariant observables here, the, uh, the first two, they just become basically the coordinates Q, E, Q, F. And you know, they will then describe the relative distance to, uh, to Augusta. And then, of course, we still have redundancy in, in here. I mean, uh, there's still QA and, and PI flying around. We can just drop them because they're fixed. That's basically a projection that takes you from that intersection to a reduced phase space um, on which you only have the variables of the degrees of freedom uh, E and F, so whatever the physics is relative to Augustin. Um, so it's basically a three-step three -step reduction procedure, and then we interpret this, basically the physics happening in that uh, in that reduced phase space as the physics seen by A, the Hamiltonian also reduces and you get rid of the, the redundant variables. Okay, that's relatively quick here. Um, now the thing is, if we want to change the perspective classically, what would we do? Well, of course, we could have done the same thing relative to Flaminia's perspective as we did for Augustin. Um, but now, the, so that would correspond to different gauge fixing surface. Now, the key thing is that this here, you can actually invert um, in this simple example. You can embed always this canonical embedding of that gauge fixed reduced phase space into the constraint surface. And then basically you would end up here on this surface. And then there's these gauge orbits. So it's clear that any point here can be mapped to, to this uh, point by gauge transformation in between. So um, that gives you a shortcut across here. And then well, you have a map, you follow these arrows, you go down here, and that gives you a map that uh, from one perspective to another. And this goes via the perspective neutral structure. So, uh, um, so basically here, that's the structure of the, of the classical perspective switches. 
There's, of course, these gauge transformations in between. I could write them also equivalently exactly in the form of, uh, of um, classical coordinate switches on a manifold um, if I use the different structure here, but uh, you can ask me later about this. But anyway, so this here, what we want to do now um, is basically to quantize this to see how that works in the, in the quantum theory. In general, will this mapping or transformation involve ambiguities due to operator ordering? Yeah, so I mean here, this is all classical so far, so there's no operator ordering at all at this stage. Um, so that's a question for the quantum theory, but in the quantum theory, that problem is separate from the, the scheme that I'm describing here. So of course, like in any quantum theory, you will have oper operator ordering ambiguities, but that's unrelated to the scheme that no, I'm... But see, that's what I don't see why it would be unrelated. So you're mapping one sort of coordinatization of phase space or ah. of a reduced phase space to another, but if your coordinates involve both the moment and positions, mm. yeah, okay. so the I mean mapping the, itself won't be... Yeah, so, so indeed, um, of course, the, the operator ordering, but let me come to this maybe later, okay, but the, it's, it's clear the operator ordering, if you make a choice later on in the physical Hilbert space, then that will map you to particular operator ordering in the, in the reduced Hilbert space. So you're right, if I chose something else in the reduced Hilbert space, then I wouldn't get that map. That's right. But let, let's maybe talk about this later, okay? So it's, uh, it, this is really not the most important point here. So the question is now how to translate that to the quantum theory. And so, okay, basically the main thing to do with the first is we want to quantize in the first step these... Uh, gauge fixed reduced Hilbert spaces using the reduction method. So that's basically you solve the constraints classically, then you quantize, so it's reduced quantization. In this example, it's really simple because if we are in A's perspective, then we have only the E and F pairs that are left over as dynamic degrees of freedom. So you can just quantize them as standards on some uh, L2 over R2. Um, the states here, for instance, in momentum representation would just be functions of the momenta of E and F in this case, and you would interpret that basically as the wave function of E and F relative to A, and that's the Hamiltonian, whatever. Okay, so now um, uh, the quantization is now the opposite ordering. You quantize first all degrees of freedom, and then you solve the constraints in the quantum series, so that's um, basically we are quantizing the perspective neutral structure. And so here, uh, how would you do that? First of all, well, we have three particles, so we have to quantize on a kinematical Hilbert space. It's an L2 over an R3. And then we have to solve the constraint. And the quantum theory, of course, is very simple in this case. So it's basically here the, the analog of the wheeler witt equation in the simple example. Um, so we want to find the, the space of state solving that constraint. Um, that you can do by group averaging. That defines you an improper projection from the kinematical Hilbert space to the physical Hilbert space. Here I should say, in contrast to what has been said a couple of times at this workshop, the space of solutions actually is not a subspace of the kinematical Hilbert space in, in, in most general cases, um, but we can argue about this later. It also has implications for entanglement, actually. The reason is that, that states that solve the constraint won't be normalized in the kinematical Hilbert space, so we have to construct a new inner product and so on. But anyway, so the projection essentially looks as follows. You have your kinematical state of three variables, and then you can represent it <laughs> Um, in this particular way that comes out of this group averaging. Again, the main point here is there exist many different ways in representing the same physical states because of the redundancy, again, also in the physical Hilbert space here. Um, so we could get rid of the A degree of freedom in solving the constraints uh, in terms of E and F, or we could have gotten rid of the E degree of freedom and so on. And this is kind of relevant because um, in this sense you can uh, basically interpret the physical states in many different uh, frames, and that's uh, crucial then for relating it to reduced quantization. And then here now observables on this Hilbert space, um, well, they have to commute with a constraint, so they're Dirac observables, because otherwise they would map you out of the space of solutions, and here in this example they're super easy, it's just really again the relative distances, like in the classical case and the momenta. And there's again a redundancy here. Um, yeah, I think you have a question. Um, is there any, any difference between doing your group averaging um, in superposition versus doing it in, in position? Mixing? No, in mixing, like by taking taking the operator and so here you're taking a state and taking the superposition. You know, your group averaging by kind of in super by taking coherent superpositions of well, arbitrary yeah. over the group. But I could also imagine constructing a mixed state by. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm like a d like a density matrix. You mean? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You could do that. Then you basically would have to 
put the projector on it from both uh, sides. Um, yeah, but it, equivalent? Is it uh, I would, yeah, I would think so. Yeah, in this example, yeah, it should be. I think, yeah. Um, but yeah, maybe let's talk later about this because I, I think I should need to move on a bit. Um, so. Oh, I guess I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, so what we have so far is we started with the original phase space of three particles, six-dimensional. Classically, we do reduction by solving constraint and gauge fixing. Then we can do reduced quantization to the reduced Hilbert space. That's basically the quantum A perspective. If you do direct quantization, you get to the physical Hilbert space that I interpret as the perspective neutral Hilbert space. And now the question is how to link these two. And um, so there has been a lot of debates about uh, uh, quantum, about the relation of the two. Um, I, let me just quickly uh, show you how to do that in this, uh, in, in this example. Um, uh, one thing is that classically um, the reduction involves, um, uh, in, involves uh, fixing gauge symmetries, and this is something that in the quantum theory you cannot do because um, the physical Hilbert space is already gauge invariant. There's no more gauge fixing there, so we have to proceed differently, and that's the main step. So we start with a perspective neutral Hilbert space. We want to go now to the reduced Hilbert space. Again, we have to choose a reference system. And then here, the second step classically would have been the gauge fixing. In the quantum theory, it's something else that I call constraint trivialization. And let me illustrate that here in this uh, particular example. If we choose Augustin's variables as the re reference frame, what is the constraint trivialization? It's a map that actually transforms the constraint in such a way that after the transformation, it applies only to the reference system, and thereby it really um, constrains the reference system, and you can then really regard it as being redundant and projected out. And so um, if you apply that to the states here, in this, in the, to the physical uh, states, then it's not a surprise that you find that the A slot um, just can be pulled out of this integral here. It's fixed to zero. Um, so it doesn't contain any relevant information anymore, and you just have um, a remaining uh, state um, over the remaining degrees of freedom, and this is basically what you will interpret as the reduced uh, state um, coming from the reduced quantization. But one has to make that more rigorous. Um, and now again, here we still have this redundancy. The third step is basically projecting on the classical gauge fixing. That's a bit like the page uh construction that you also um, project on states of whatever you choose as your reference clock. And then you get rid of this redundancy. And here, um, that would be the quantum reduction map. Here in this particular example, you can just project on QA equals zero, and then you get rid of that first term. And then you're just left with that remaining uh, state here. And then what you can check also is that this uh, trivialization map here transforms the Dirac observables, this relative observables correctly to what they should be on the, on the reduced Hilbert space. And in fact, it also transforms the dynamics correctly. And you can also show that this uh, reduction map, in fact, is an, is an isometry. So it also preserves the inner product. It maps dynamics correctly, states correctly, and uh, observables correctly. And so in that sense, you can really view that as the, uh, classical, uh, as the quantum reduction map that relates um, uh, Dirac and reduced quantization. Now, we could have done the same thing now for F's perspective. The main point is you can here, in this case, invert these maps. And in that way, you can switch quantum perspectives by going from the reduced Hilbert space relative to F to that relative to A by inverting the quantum reduction procedure going by the perspective neutral Hilbert space and then mapping forward. And in this case, it's really simple for this model here. It's, you know, it's the trivialization. It's the, here's the projection on the gauge fixing. The inversion here, you basically just append that uh, factor that we had dropped before. This one you can just stagger. And then um, here the map from here to there, you can write it down like this. It actually simplifies a lot. You can write it in terms of a much simpler uh, form. Uh, this here is called parity swap operator. And what is kind of cute about this is that this transformation here had been um, proposed earlier in a different work um, by these guys from Vienna, but they didn't use at all any constraint uh, system or any, uh, any of this perspective neutral structure. So this here, this is, comes from quantum foundation, so we can now see also how to embed the transformations that were um, uh, um, proposed in quantum foundations um, here in such a, in such a um, perspective neutral structure. Let me maybe say one more thing on the last slide because I want to tell you something about operational consequences of this perspective switch. Um, that's quite interesting. So this comes actually from, from their paper. Let me just give you one example, the last, uh, this, this uh, panel here. So here, um, 
so okay, they label their frames differently, but so this year would be the description of, let's say, Alice and Bob from Charlie's frame. And, and this year indicates that Alice and Bob are actually in a, entangled um, uh, with relative distance L fixed. And if you now apply to this, um, this map here, that you derive in this way, what you get is actually going to A's perspective. What you find is that Charlie and Bob will be in a product state, and in fact, Bob will be at a peak position while C gets delocalized. So that shows you that these maps here actually, that the notion of quantum correlations and also of superposition actually becomes quantum frame dependent. Um, so I think I'm horribly going over time, um, so let me not say much more about this. Um, and the main message is, well, you can generalize this to all kinds of other models also for relational observables, but the structure in the end that you get is you have your physical Hilbert space, you have quantum coordinate maps that are these quantum symmetry reduction uh, maps, and then you have your reduced quantum series that are basically the quantum frame perspectives, and you can switch um, the perspectives using, again, such a compositional structure like in the classical case, and in this way you can also uh, indeed uh, resolve this multiple choice problem. So I think I'd better stop here, and uh, yeah, if there's any questions, then uh, thanks for your attention. Yeah. Questions or discussion? Uh, you said earlier that um, this, the Hilbert space of physical states uh, might not be a subset of the kinematical Hilbert mm -hmm. space. Can you elaborate on this? Yes. So let me maybe, uh, um, maybe go to this example because there you will, wait a minute, uh, probably see that a bit easier. Um, so I mean, the, I should probably, well, so the, the inner product on the kinematic Hilbert space would just be the usual you know, integral over all three Ps, basically. And now um, the point is that this operator here has a continuous spectrum around zero. So zero eigenstates are basically improper eigenstates, if you want. So you can think of them as momentum eigenstates in quantum mechanics. And momentum eigenstates are also not normalized in, in your standard inner product. And here you can see that, of course, if you take the physical uh, states here, um, you only integrate over uh, two variables. But you have um, three variable slots here. If you were to um, just use the standard inner product of two such states, then um, basically, there's, there's one slot too much in it that you don't integrate over, and that gives you a delta function and so a divergence in the end. And you said that this affects what you call entanglement? Yeah, so, uh, right. Um, but that's, uh, okay, so that's the, um, um, okay, I think everybody gets tested on this blackboard, and I'm showing I'm not up to it. Uh, <laughs> no, wait, this is, this is ridiculously complicated. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so in general, so this is always true when the, when the constraint has a continuous spectrum around zero. You will always have that problem also with the wheeler dewitt equation. So in that sense, generally, you will have um, that the physical Hilbert space is not actually a subset of the kinematic Hilbert space you start out with. And now why is that something, um, is that a challenge also for entanglement, is if you define entanglement in the kinematic Hilbert space, um, that might really not mean very much in the physical Hilbert space. And as an extreme example, if you pick um, three-dimensional vacuum quantum gravity, um, the kinematic Hilbert space is, well, it's an infinite dimensional Hilbert space with lots of states. And uh, it turns out that the physical Hilbert space is just one-dimensional. So it's uh, so in 3D vacuum uh, QG, you will find that um, this here is basically just C. And this here is, well, it's a very large Hilbert space. So in this here, you have local degrees of freedom. But when you solve the constraints, it's a topological theory. There's no more local degrees of freedom. And so talking about uh, entanglement here on the kinematic Hilbert space might really not tell you anything at all about what happens in the physical Hilbert space. So that's an extreme example, but it just indicates that in general, you have to be careful where you talk about entanglement, whether you talk about entanglement here or here. And in the end, this is what should be relevant on the physical Hilbert space. And the, so that's actually probably one structure that should have been added yesterday to the, to the discussion, to the Hilbert space structures there. I mean, we're always talking here that we should be careful that in quantum field theory, 
Hilbert spaces don't factorize, um, and that that's a, sh a challenge for quantum uh, for for entanglement. Uh, that's maybe another here that you have to be careful with. Go ahead. This one. Yeah. So I liked your example quite a lot, um, but it I couldn't quite see from this how I'm going to apply this to the Hamiltonian constraint, where now time is non-fundamental. Yeah. Um, so I, I have also slides on that, but uh, I'm not sure if I will. Uh, Maybe the one sentence summary. Okay. So I mean, the, it's indeed. So I mean, that's the reason why um, I would have had to say a bit more about it, because, about these relational observables, how that works, and that's why um, I chose the simpler example. But in that case, um, basically, you, I mean, you use relational observables again. So basically, classically, that would amount to deparametrizing the flow of the Hamiltonian constraint. So basically, use a dynamical. So let's say in quantum cosmology, you could use, um, for instance, a massless scalar field as a that is a dynamical degree of freedom that increases monotonically along the flow of the Hamiltonian constraint. So that would be a good relational clock. And then you could, for instance, say, now I want to know what the value of the scale factor is relative to that uh, to that clock. Classically, that's well defined. Those you can write down also as these relational observables, as Dirac observables on the constraint surface in the end, and that you can also quantize then in the quantum theory. And then you can also get rid of the um, of the uh, redundant clock degrees of freedom by projecting them out in the same way, but you still have all the information about the dynamics because the um, the clock values have become a parameter in the observables. I mean, it's probably easier when saw that in an example, but I mean, so this really is. Uh, um, I don't know if I maybe should uh, well, go to slide to explain this. I mean, so it's really it's related to the problem of time um, and how to resolve it in relational ways and. Um, the main point is that when you use clocks um, and, and you remove their dynamic degrees of freedom, you still have the trace of the clock as a parameter in your, in your, uh, in your observables. And so you have basically a one parameter family of uh, relational observables and, um, and those time parameters you can then really view as the values of the clock. Um, but I think I should probably explain that on a blackboard or so because it's, I, yeah. I think that was like partly my question, but I'll ask a slightly watered down or a different thing here. Um, in this context, could you kind of like reiterate what the connection between this construction and Page Wooters like directly might be? Because in Page Wooters, you have like one Hilbert space, and they keep splitting in different possible ways. Yeah. So I mean, and in Page, yeah. So yeah. Page Wooters is not exactly the same thing. I mean, so mm -hmm. there, of course, in the usual Page Wooters construction, you have, um, you know, you have a total Hilbert space that's just. Uh, the system times the clock, mm -hmm. and then you have a Hamiltonian in standard form without any interactions or anything like this. Mm -hmm. um, well, and then you basically look at states solving whatever that global Hamiltonian constraint yeah. is. Mm -hmm. um, that's a, in that case actually usually a subspace of this one here. And then okay, but then if you want to get the Schrödinger equation out of it, you have to project also on the um, the on, the, on the on the values of the of the clock. Mm -hmm. the, uh, on the clock states. And so there is a bit of similarity here, as you have seen, that mm. I also project out stuff, but the way it's done here is actually uh, different. So nevertheless, I think the, so I haven't worked this out, but I think the transformations to, um, um, to switch clocks, okay, I didn't show them to you actually, but, um, but I think those will actually also apply in the Page Wooters formulation. But I mean, so the main point in Page Wooters is of course you also, in the end, you basically go from your total Hilbert space and then uh, you go to your, I mean, two states on the system Hilbert mm -hmm. space when you describe the dynamics. So mm -hmm. you also have uh, basically global Hilbert space and then that's essentially a reduced, a reduced uh, one. Yeah. But the way you do it is, is a bit different here. Nevertheless, I think technically uh, is the, the shape of the maps, if you want to switch clocks, so suppose mm -hmm. you add here another clock, two, one, and the way you would switch between them, actually, in this case, I think the maps that I've constructed, they would be the same. So just to like be sure, um, yeah. page boot is somehow, somehow like, um, it's like subsumed within this larger construction in a certain uh, sense. No, no, no. So I haven't, so no, here I haven't that. actually no. worked, so I haven't done any, so okay. it doesn't any, assume anything about page boot here. Right. And the other thing also, the nice thing is here, so here I don't need to work with uh, Hamiltonians that don't have any interaction, so you can also, uh, deal with interactions here in this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I wonder how do you apply this to, to gravity, say, when you have um, some sort of superposed geometry? Can you comment on that? Yeah, so, um, so, I mean, so if you have a superposed geometry, um, uh, yeah, so I think I would probably need uh, my slides, but... Uh, we'll yeah. we're, we're okay. So I mean, the thing is that basically if you quantize uh, GR, then, um, uh, for instance, the cosmological model, simplest example, so here I had positions and momenta of these three particles, but for instance, if you take a cosmological model, then um, the degrees of freedom could be like the scalar field, the scale factor, and their canonical momenta in the ADM formulation, and then you quantize that, and that already corresponds to basically superposing uh, classical geometries. So in that case, really simple, homogeneous isotropic uh, 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 geometries, um, but you can do that arbitrarily quantumness in there, and the, the same <coughs> scheme works in that, so I've already worked that out as well. Yeah. Okay. Last. I just wondered if you could comment on the issue that I mentioned yesterday about um, in the paper by Ashtakar and Horowitz, that the negative ADM mass metric seemed to be play a role in the direct quantization Hilbert space, but they would sort of be eliminated ab initio in any gauge fixing. So what's the story? I mean, uh, yes, is so there physics in that discrepancy? Yeah, so I mean, for that particular story, I can't tell you the exact answer because I haven't worked this out for um, really fields here in GR yet. So all of what I've done so far is really for finite dimensional systems. But still, I mean, this is related to the fact that always on the perspective neutral structure, you have much more structure in it, many more states that, don't, um, you, that you cannot always map to, uh, to the reduced Hilbert space because the reduction map isn't always uh, globally defined. So, and um, that's why you see that also in terms of, um, okay, actually the, the easiest example where you can see something like this is where you do um, a three-dimensional version of the example that, that I was discussing, where you have also rotation invariance and so on. What you see there is that on the global Hilbert space, you can account for any configurations of the particles and momenta. There's no obstructions to it. But if you map to um, particular perspectives, then you cannot account for all of these uh, configurations. Um, and that has to do with the Gribov problem, basically, that, uh, um, that uh, gauge fixing is not always globally valid. And then you can only do it locally. And then there are certain physical configurations from the um, physical Hilbert space that, uh, that just don't appear at all in the reduced Hilbert space because. For an N particle? Yeah. You're saying that's true for an N particle system? Yeah. So that's a. Already? So, yeah, that's a three dimensional N body problem, yes. So there you so, see that. But what's your conclusion? Are you saying that you miss something essential about the quantum mechanics of the system if you insist on reducing it? No, so the, pa the point is really that... Or is that it unphysical <laughs> stuff that you're no, missing? No, so um, in these particle models, the interpretation would really be that perspectives are not always global. They can't account for all, um, for all configurations. In some sense, a bit analogous to how coordinate, change, uh, coordinate maps are also not always global in space-time. So that's, uh, here in this particle model, that would be the interpretation. So you cannot describe all, all the physical configurations with respect to all reference frames. Because the thing is that, I mean, I would have to show you that technically, but the thing is that you, you always run into divergencies. And that's, um, that's similar to divergencies like at the uh, Schwarzschild horizon or something like this. It's a coordinate effect in a way. And these coordinate effects, they would show up in the quantum perspectives, but not in the perspective neutral structure. Yeah. Okay, very interesting. Uh, let's thank both of the speakers again and uh, move to lunch. <laughs> <laughs>